In this lesson, we're going to continue our look at mass spectrometry, focusing on the fragmentation patterns of various functional groups. Remember that when performing mass spectrometry on an alkane, any carbon-carbon bond can cleave. Now with the functional groups we're going to be looking at, that's no longer the case. Let's start off with alkyl halides. The first difference you might notice compared to alkanes is how the actual ionization occurs. In an alkane, we really can't tell where the electron came from that was knocked out. Now with an alkyl halide, you can see we actually removed an electron from the halogen. And this is going to be the case with any functional group that has a heteroatom, because all of those heteroatoms are going to have at least one lone pair. Lone pair electrons are in a non-bonding molecular orbital, and that has a higher energy than the electrons in a bonding orbital. And since non-bonding orbitals are at higher energy, it takes less energy to remove an electron than from a bonding orbital. Because the electron is essentially always going to be easily removed from that halogen, it tends to focus and limit the kinds of fragmentations that can occur. So as it turns out, alkyl halides have two major modes of fragmentation. The first is CX bond cleavage, and it's exactly what it sounds like. The carbon to halogen bond simply cleaves. And here we can see another big difference between the fragmentations on alkanes versus a functional group like an alkyl halide. When a carbon-carbon bond in an alkane cleaved, it could fragment in either of two directions. Essentially, the electron could end up on one carbon or the other of that original bond. When the carbon-halogen bond in an alkyl halide cleaves, the electron prefers to go with the more electronegative halogen. And that means there's only one fragmentation for that bond. The halogen simply falls off as a radical, leaving behind a carbocation. In this case, we can see that the bromine-carbon bond breaks to form a bromine radical and a propyl cation. And again, you're only going to see the charged particle in a mass spec experiment. So that means you're going to see a peak at 43, representing that propyl carbocation. The other main mode of fragmentation for an alkyl halide is alpha cleavage. The alpha here simply refers to the first carbon-carbon bond after the halogen. And there could be as many as three alpha bonds in an alkyl halide. In this simple example, there's only just the one. In an alpha cleavage, the two electrons in that alpha bond essentially unpair. One electron goes to the carbon on the left, the other electron goes to the carbon on the right. Now, when that bond is broken, the fragments on the right, you now have two adjacent atoms, a carbon and a bromine, each with an unpaired electron. So what happens is those electrons pair up to form a new bond, in this case, a pi bond. In this example, the mass of that cation is 93. But if we look at that mass relative to the mass of the molecular ion, we can see that this is going to be an M minus 29 peak. And that's simply from loss of an ethyl radical. So on an alkyl halide, the various peaks that you get from alpha cleavage will essentially tell you the masses of the alkyl groups that are attached to the functionalized carbon. In this case, because we have an M minus 29 peak, that means that there must have been an ethyl group attached to the functional carbon. Now with alkyl halides, there's actually one more useful piece of information we can often extract from a mass spec. The two most common halogens, chlorine and bromine, actually exist in nature as two different isotopes. Chlorine exists as both chlorine-35 and chlorine-37, and the ratio of those two isotopes is 3 to 1. Bromine also exists as a mixture of two isotopes with masses of 79 and 81, here with a ratio of 1 to 1. What this means is that for alkyl chlorides and alkyl bromides, any fragment that actually has a halogen atom in it will actually give rise to two peaks with two different masses separated by two AMU. The ratio of the relative abundance of those two peaks can actually tell you which halogen is present in that ion. A 3 to 1 ratio of the lighter mass to the higher mass means that you have a chlorine, and a 1 to 1 ratio of the lighter mass to the higher mass means you have a bromine. So here we have an example mass spec for an alkyl halide, specifically 2-chloropropane. Now anytime you're looking at a mass spectrum, the first thing you probably should do is look for the peak with the highest mass, because that's most likely going to be your molecular ion. And what we see here are two peaks separated by two AMU. The peak of lower mass is three times the size as the peak of higher mass. 
and that tells me we have that 3 to 1 isotopic ratio separated by 2 AMU, so these fragments have a chlorine atom in them. If we look at the next pair of peaks to the left, we can see again two peaks separated by 2 AMU with a 3 to 1 ratio. So again, whatever is giving rise to these peaks must have a chlorine atom in it. Now the masses of 63 and 65 don't tell us a lot, but again, if we represent those masses relative to the molecular ion, each peak is simply an M minus 15. You just have to do it twice because we actually have two molecular ions, depending on which isotope was present in each specific fragment. Now remember, in alkyl halides, the only way to lose an alkyl group is through loss of an alkyl radical through alpha cleavage. So what this tells me is I have at least one methyl group attached to the functionalized carbon. And if you look at the structure of 2-chloropropane, we can see that we actually have two methyl groups attached to the carbon that is bonded to the chlorine. The only other peak on the spectrum has a mass of 43, and that's a mass you should recognize because 43 is a propyl group. And the propyl group in this case is formed from the CX cleavage. This peak actually comes from a secondary propyl cation, if you think about it. And note that we don't have that sort of isotopic ratio here. That's because the propyl cation doesn't have a chlorine atom in it, so it's only going to show up as one peak. Now the fragmentations we're going to see for the remaining functional groups are all pretty similar to what we saw with alkyl halides. Let's take a look at the fragmentations on ethers. Again, if you look at the structure of an ether, you can see that the oxygen, that's a heteroatom, it has lone pairs. So again, we know exactly what electron will most easily be removed during ionization. It's going to be one of those lone pair electrons. And it's going to result in, again, that same kind of focused and limited fragmentation that we saw similar to alkyl halides. So here we have this very simple ether methoxyethane, and it has in the molecular ion a mass to charge ratio of 60, again, representing the actual molecular weight of the original molecule. And we actually see the same two types of fragmentation here that we saw with alkyl halides. CX bond cleavage and alpha cleavage. The only difference here is that you're guaranteed to have two CX bond cleavages because the ether has oxygen bonded to two carbons. And that means there's two carbon oxygen bonds to cleave. So cleavage of the CO bond on the left here dissected with a red line would result in an ethyl carbocation and a methoxy radical. Again, you would only see the carbocation because it's the only particle that's charged and an ethyl cation has a mass of 29. Again, note that just like with alkyl halides, when that bond fragments, the electron ends up going with the more electronegative oxygen. Cleavage of the CO bond on the right, here dissected with the green line, results in the loss of an ethoxy radical and formation of a methyl cation. And the methyl cation, of course, has a mass of 15. So in an ether, the CX bond cleavage tells you exactly what kinds of groups were actually attached to either side of the oxygen. Now with ethers, we also have alpha cleavage. Highly branched ethers can actually have a lot of alpha bonds to cleave. Here we only have just the one, the carbon-carbon bond in that ethyl group. Again, in alpha cleavage, the two electrons in that alpha bond split up, one electron going with each of the two atoms. In this case, the electron that goes to the right carbon is now adjacent to the unpaired electron on the oxygen, so they pair up to form a pi bond. So here we get this sort of strange looking cation with a mass of 45. And again, 45 isn't all that useful, but when we express it relative to the molecular ion, this is simply an M minus 15 peak. So it's a peak from loss of a methyl radical. So here I have an example mass spec of a more complicated ether. Again, the first thing I'm gonna do is look for the peak of highest mass, which in this case is 116, and it's probable that that would be the molecular ion. We can see that we have four fragment ions, and two of them actually have masses that look familiar. We have this very tall peak at 43, and this shorter peak right next to it at 57. And those represent a propyl and a butyl cation. And remember, with an ether, when you see peaks that have the mass of one of these common alkyl groups, those fragments came from CX cleavage, and those masses represent the masses of the alkyl groups attached to the oxygen. And that means that this ether has some kind of a butyl group attached to the oxygen and some kind of a propyl group attached to the oxygen. If you actually look at the structure, you can see that we actually have a secondary butyl group and a secondary propyl group attached to the oxygen. If we look at the other two peaks, we can see masses of 87 and 101. Again, those masses themselves don't tell us much. However, the peak with a mass of 101 represents a molecular ion minus 15, so loss of methyl. 
and the peak at 87 represents M-29, or loss of ethyl. And the way that an ether loses simple alkyl groups is through alpha cleavage. And again, if you look at the structure, if you look at the two carbons directly bonded to the oxygen, what are the alkyl groups attached to those carbons? And we see that those carbons have only methyl and ethyl groups attached. So let's take a look at the fragmentation patterns on alcohols. Again, an alcohol, that is a heteroatom containing functional group, so we know when the ionization occurs, we're going to lose an electron from the oxygen. So here we can see from this ethanol molecule, the molecular ion will have a mass of 46. Now alcohols undergo similar fragmentations with what we saw for alkyl halides and ethers, except instead of a true CX cleavage, what we see in an alcohol is a dehydration. And the dehydration is essentially a CX cleavage and then also loss of another hydrogen. So in other words, the hydroxy group leaves, but so does another hydrogen. So it loses water. And since water always has a mass of 18, assuming we have the most abundant isotopes for hydrogen and oxygen, that means that when you see an M-18 peak, it means you have an alcohol, because only alcohols can do this dehydration and lose water. Alcohols also undergo the same sort of alpha cleavage that we saw with ethers and alkyl halides, breaking the first carbon-carbon bond next to the heteroatom. Again, just as before, that alpha bond breaks, unpairing the electrons, allowing the formation of a new pi bond between the one carbon and the oxygen. In this case, that results in the loss of a methyl radical, so we see a peak at M minus 15. So here we have an example mass spectrum of an alcohol, in this case, one butanol. And we're only going to look at the peaks that we can kind of interpret. Again, look at the peak with the highest mass, in this case, 74. That's probably your molecular ion. Now, alcohols have this quirk that they often will not show the molecular ion, and if they do, it typically is very, very low in intensity. And you can see that here. We have this peak with a mass of 74. That's the mass of our 1-butanol, but it's a very small peak. And we really only have two other peaks that we can easily interpret. We have one at a mass of 56, which again, in and of itself, isn't all that useful. That mass, relative to the molecular ion, is an M-18 peak. And again, that's really indicative of an alcohol because 18 is the mass of water, and alcohols undergo dehydration. The other peak we can interpret has a mass of 31, and again, that's not terribly useful, but when we compare that mass to the mass of the molecular ion, we see that this is an M-43, and 43 is a propyl group. And loss of an alkyl group in an alcohol is alpha cleavage, and that means that we have some kind of a propyl group attached to the functionalized carbon. And if you look at the structure, that's exactly what we see we have a primary propyl group attached directly to that functionalized carbon. We're going to wrap up by looking at the fragmentation patterns for ketones. A ketone is actually a carbonyl compound, a compound that has a carbon-oxygen double bond, and a ketone specifically has that carbonyl attached to two alkyl groups. Now, because ketones have a heteroatom, and that heteroatom, oxygen, has lone pairs on it, again, we know exactly where the ionization is going to occur. We're going to lose an electron, from the oxygen. Now because the heteroatom is actually double bonded in a ketone, we don't see the CX bond cleavage. It would actually have to break two bonds, a double bond, for the heteroatom to leave. But we still see the alpha cleavages that we saw when we looked at the other functional groups. Again, breaking the first carbon-carbon bond after the heteroatom. So here, this particular ketone has a mass of 86, and it has two alpha bonds. Fragmentation of the left alpha bond, here I have again depicted with a red line, would result in loss of a propyl radical. And again, a new pi bond is going to form between the other carbon and the heteroatom. But because that carbon was already double bonded to that oxygen, it will now be triple bonded. Regardless, what we see is a peak that weighs 43. And because the mass of the molecular ion was 86, that means that this also represents an M-43 peak. And that comes again from the loss of a propyl radical. Cleavage of the alpha bond on the right here, drawn with a green line through it, would be a loss of a methyl radical, again forming a carbon-oxygen triple bond in the other fragment. So here we have a mass of 71, but again, looking at that with respect to the molecular ion mass, we see this is an M-15 peak, loss of a methyl radical. Ketones and some other carbonyl compounds have another fragmentation pattern called the McClafferty rearrangement and it is a little bit complicated. 
The McLafferty rearrangement actually results in the cleavage of two separate bonds, a carbon-carbon bond and a carbon-H bond. In order for a ketone to undergo the McLafferty rearrangement, it has to have what's called a gamma carbon. If you start from the carbonyl and then go up the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma. So a carbon three atoms removed from the carbonyl. The net result is the loss of an alkene away from the actual alpha-beta carbon bond. In this case, we would see the loss of a molecule of ethene, so we would see an M-28 peak. So here I have a sample mass spectrum of a ketone. And again, in this case, you can see that the peak of highest mass, that's going to be our molecular ion, mass of 86. And then the other three peaks that we have on the spectrum, we have a peak at mass 71, which again in and of itself isn't that interesting, but we look at it as an M minus 15 peak, and we can see that this is going to wind up being an alpha cleavage by loss of a methyl group. And again, with a ketone, that tells you that one of the groups directly attached to the carbonyl is a methyl group. We have another peak at 58. Again, that mass doesn't really mean much, but if we look at it as an M minus 28 peak, that's from loss of ethene. In other words, that peak is coming from that weird McLafferty rearrangement. And then the last peak we see with a mass of 43, which in this case is a quirky one because the mass of the molecular ion is 86, and then 86 minus 43 is also 43. So the M minus 43 here means that it is losing a propyl group. And again, this is another alpha cleavage. And that tells us that on this ketone, we have a propyl group directly attached to the carbonyl. So if you look at the actual structure, you can see that's exactly what we have. We have a carbonyl, and on one side of it, we have a methyl group, and on the other side of it, we have a propyl group.